Welcome to the Columbia County Democratic Committee Congressional Candidate Forum 2022. Uh, my name is Sam Hodge and I'm the chair of the Columbia County Democrats and your host this evening. In 47 days, we have an election. On August 23rd, Democrats in Columbia County will be tasked to vote in a special election to fill the remainder of Antonio Delgado's term in Congress and taking place on the same day, August 23rd, a primary election to determine our next representative in the new 19th congressional district. The entire country will be looking at what we do. This race, the first special election after the Supreme Court's abhorrent decision in Dobbs will be amplified by the national press as a bellwether for the nation. Pat Ryan, the Democrat, the current Ulster County executive is facing off against anti-choice, failed gubernatorial candidate, Mark Molinaro. Everyone on this call must vote for Pat Ryan. It's all going to come down to turnout. We vote, we win. We volunteer, we win. Phone banks, texting, door knocking, postcards, we need to do it all to win. Later tonight, after this forum, there's going to be a you know, quote unquote special CCDC meeting, and we're going to hear from Pat Ryan's campaign about all the ways that we can ensure victory this August. But now is time for the main event, the primary election for the new 19th Congressional District. Tonight's forum is a showcase of the two candidates vying to represent us, Jamie Cheney and Josh Riley. A few notes. Tonight's event is being recorded and we will share a link to the recording following the event. Closed captioning is available. Please click at the bottom. There's a closed caption icon. You click on that and you click enable and then you'll be able to get closed captions. All participants are muted. And prior to tonight, we also provided registered attendees with access to a Google form to submit questions. Questions can also be submitted today for the candidates in the chat box. So send your questions to submit questions here. Um, that is being manned by our communications chair, Todd Wolforth. He will be combining and consolidating frequently asked questions, giving preference to the order in which the questions were received. And our hope is to cover as many topics as possible. So he will get your question. If he sees other questions, let's say about abortion, He'll combine them if appropriate, and then he'll pass the question on to me to ask the candidates. And we'll be alternating bef uh, between the Google form and the chat box, ensuring that we cover as many topics as possible. If you have technical issues, please use the chat feature to contact Claire Ackerman, and we will do our best to help you out. You can also email uh, events at columbiacountydemocrats.org, and we'll put that in the chat box for you also, and we're going to be try to checking it throughout the night. Um, I do ask for your indulgence for any technical glitches in advance as we are navigating a rather large group. Lastly, uh, I want to thank uh, all the people who put this together. It's not as easy as just creating a Zoom link. Uh, Claire Ackerman is an utter all-star. And I just want to shout out her efforts, Mike Dvorak's efforts, um, Todd Wolferth, Dave Berman, Joyce Thompson, and all the other volunteers who did a practice Zoom with us earlier this morning. Um, final ground rules. Uh, each candidate will be afforded five minutes to make an opening statement. And following their remarks, the question and answer portion will begin. I will ask the question and then each candidate will have two minutes to answer and will alternate who answers first. Uh, prior to uh, the commencement of this event, I picked a number between one and 100, it was 72. Uh, Jamie Cheney was closer to it. And so Jamie Cheney will be going first uh, in our opening statements. So ladies and gentlemen, let's get this forum started and I'm gonna pass it off to Jamie Cheney for five minutes.
Hi, thanks all. Well, I guess that was our first tech glitch of the night. Thank you, Claire, for jumping in and unmuting me. And thank you, Columbia Dems, for another phenomenally well-organized and well-turned-out event. I am always incredibly, incredibly impressed as to how many people come together for these things. And thank you so much for having me here tonight. As we get into July, I want to start with some really, really exciting updates from our campaign. In just over five weeks on the campaign trail, we've raised well over $500,000. We've knocked on over a thousand doors and we have visited each county in the district multiple times. This has been a true, true grassroots effort and I've been so, so inspired by the outpouring of support. For those of you who have been a part of that effort, thank you. I wanna offer my most sincere thank you. Many of you probably heard from me at the Columbia Dam summer event or the rally in Hudson the next day. Tonight, I wanna to share a different story, one that I'm just getting used to telling publicly. So please forgive any emotion. About a decade ago, I faced a choice that every woman dreads. I was in the first trimester of a pregnancy and due to a rare immune disorder, I became incredibly sick. I had young children that I was too sick to take care of. And when the doctors found the medication that I needed, they told me that it had a high risk of causing serious, serious birth defects for the fetus that I was carrying. So for the well-being of my family as a whole, my husband and I made the decision to have an abortion. We made a healthcare decision that was right for our entire family. And then 10 years later, I guess about two weeks ago now, I sat in our campaign office surrounded by my campaign team, which is primarily women. And it's a group that ranges from their mid twenties to their early sixties. And to a person, we all broke down in quiet tears as we learned that a Republican controlled Supreme Court had informed us that the very right to that type of healthcare that I was able to access for the well being of my family, the healthcare that I made a choice to access was being taken away. I don't need to read about what this decision means in a policy paper. I know firsthand the impact that this decision has on women across the country because I've lived it. And I tell you this because I refuse to take this defeat sitting down. That's very much been the story of my entire career. When I see problems, I don't just execute someone else's strategy. I attack the problem head on and I think of creative solutions to bring about needed change. This started after the birth of my third son. As a young mother, I saw firsthand the struggles that women had in the workplace as they balanced the demands of work and family. This wasn't new territory. Women for generations have known this, but I decided to tackle it with the creative approach. I jumped into the fray and I founded a company whose mission was to help keep working parents in the workforce and provide them with the things like flexible schedules and subsidized childcare that they needed to be successful. This meant going to some of the oldest and most entrenched institutions in our country, not unlike Washington DC, and convincing these leaders that it was time to change. 10 years later, I've built a successful company that has helped tens of thousands of parents balance what it means to have a family and feed that family. This is the kind of leadership that this district needs in this moment. And it extends far beyond Roe. To win this election, we need to build a coalition around shared lived experiences. Republican women who know that there's no place in this country for assault weapons, independent men, who recognize that climate change is an existential threat to all of our way of life. Disaffected voters who just need to hear that the government is going to lower their Medicare premiums and increase their social security payouts. Don't tell me that these two problems are too big to fix. I've heard that before and it hasn't fazed me. I've jumped in and I've tackled it. I'm in this race because you deserve a representative who understands what we are facing and who is ready to take on the fight. And I'm proud to say that especially with a committee like the Columbia Democratic Committee and the kind of turnout we have tonight and the kind of energy this county has, 
I know that together that we can fight and deliver for New York 19. But I also know that there's simply no other choice. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. I'm now gonna hand the floor over to Josh. Hi, everybody. Can everybody hear me okay? Thumbs up if you can hear me. Good, great. Uh, well, thank you all so much for being here. And uh, Jamie, um, first of all, uh, thank you for sharing that story. I can't imagine the amount of courage uh, it takes. And so um, thank you uh, for, for doing that. Um, I want to thank all of you for coming. And, and I know this is really hard to put on a big event like this. Sam, Claire, Mike, Todd, everybody who worked so hard to pull this together. Uh, thank you. And uh, to the entire committee, really. I mean, look, um, we're facing some huge challenges and you've been through a lot over the last couple of weeks. The district lines have changed multiple times. Your member of Congress is now uh, the Lieutenant Governor and uh, it feels like the world is on fire. And through it all, you all have been resilient and patient um, and I uh, have really, uh, as I've gotten to know you all, uh, admired that and really appreciate it. What I'm hoping to do with my couple minutes that I have here is talk about three things. One, my deep roots in this district, which have informed my principles and my values and my desire to represent you. The experience that I have that's relevant, that's going to allow me to hit the ground running on day one to address a lot of these big challenges we're facing. And then third, I'd love to give a campaign update. So uh, first, a little bit about me and my background. Um, I was born and raised in Endicott, New York, just outside of Binghamton, and I have a very typical upstate New York uh, background. My folks came here about 100 years ago to work in the local plants. They were tanners in the shoe factory for a long time and maintenance workers in the IBM plants. And as I was growing up, we saw a lot of those jobs uh, shipped overseas. I often tell a story about how I was delivered the newspapers in the morning and you would see the headlines of job losses and layoffs in my hometown. And on the very same page, you would see headlines about corporate profits soaring. And that economic inequality has stayed with me uh, throughout uh, my career. And it's informed a lot of the work that I've done. And it's informed uh, the work that's given me the experience I'll need to hit the ground running for all of you addressing the big challenges we're facing. I got my start in public service working for Congressman Maurice Hinchy, who really inspired me uh, to see the good that can be accomplished in politics and uh, really held out as a model for what uh, we need to do and focus on with respect to constituent services. I went to work at the U.S. Department of Labor as a policy analyst where I focused on unemployment insurance and trade adjustment and workforce training programs, exactly the types of policies that were needed in the community that I grew up in and across upstate New York. Uh, I did a fellowship on the Senate Health, Education, and Labor and Pensions Committee, where I worked uh, to try to raise the minimum wage, and I tried to strengthen the Family Medical Leave Act. As a dad, uh, the best thing I've done in the course of my entire career was take five months off to bond with my son, and I believe that every single family, regardless of their economic circumstances, uh, should have that same opportunity. When I graduated from law school, I had uh, a bunch of offers to go work with the big banks on Wall Street, and instead I decided to go to the South and partner with the American Academy of Pediatrics on a landmark civil rights lawsuit uh, to get kids access to the health care services they needed. And I argued then in federal court and continue to believe today that health care should be a civil right, and that includes uh, access to abortion care. Uh, I served as a law clerk to Judge Kim Wardlaw on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, where I basically spent my days studying the Constitution. That's an experience I draw on a lot now as a candidate, given the challenges we are facing, the threats to our democracy and the threats to basic constitutional rights, like uh, women's ability to choose for themselves. Uh, I later served as counsel for Senator Al Franken on the Senate Judiciary Committee, where I helped stop big corporate mergers that would have raised prices for consumers. I worked to restore the Voting Rights Act, and I brought Democrats and Republicans together to get legislation passed in a very, very divided Washington. Um, at the time, the Senate was very narrowly divided. Republicans controlled the House, and even in that environment, I was able to get legislation uh, passed and, and signed into law. Uh, more recently, in private legal practice, I've, I've taken on big insurance companies that were raising their rates against small businesses, and I filed briefs in the Supreme Court challenging the Trump administration's Muslim ban and other immigration policies, an issue that's important to me because my wife's the daughter of immigrants. I launched this campaign last November, and I'm really excited about the momentum we've built. We've now raised over $1.2 million. That's more money than any Democratic challenger in all of upstate New York. 
We've done it without accepting a single pa- uh, penny of corporate PAC money. In fact, most of our contributions are $25 or less. Uh, six of the Democratic committees across this 11 county district have endorsed a candidate in this race. All of them have endorsed our campaign, and I'm really proud of that. Uh, we've also picked up uh, support from a number of local leaders, including Broome County Executive Jason Garner last night. And I'm really excited about the momentum we're building and uh, being able to keep it going with all of you. All right, at that pleasant chime, it's, <laughs> it's time for our first question and that will go to you, Josh. Sure. Uh, the, thir- the first question relates to abortion. Um, do you support a federal law that guarantees women their reproductive rights regardless of where they live? Absolutely, absolutely, 100%. We get two minutes, I could end my answer there. 100% unequivocally, yes. Um, I think it's really important that candidates who are running for this office owe you, we're, we're all really angry about what we're seeing. Um, folks who are applying for this really important job of representing you in Washington owe you a plan for what we're gonna do about it. That's important because uh, it's the right thing to do, but also you need to hold us accountable uh, when we go to Washington. And so I, here, here's the plan I have uh, to fight back against this terrible decision. Number one, I'm going to co-sponsor the Women's Health Protection Act. That's going to codify Roe v. Wade back into statutory law out of the reach of judges. Number two, it's not enough to codify Roe v. Wade. We also have to close the loopholes that states like Texas were using to create bounty programs. Uh, that's going to require amending some of our uh, jurisdictional statutes around uh, the courts. Number three, we need to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, as a lawyer in private practice, I filed briefs on behalf of the American Association of University Women, the National Organization of Women, and others trying to get the Equal Rights Amendment ratified. Uh, we should do that because the Supreme Court's decision relied on the 14th Amendment and they interpreted it the wrong way. Let's put a new amendment in the Constitution that's crystal clear, black and white, uh, that women's equality is part of the Constitution, and that includes. Uh, access to abortion. Uh, Another step that I've already started working on and that I'll continue to take in Congress is to make sure that even with Roe v. Wade being overturned, women have access to FDA approved abortion medications. I believe that women have that legal right today under existing law. I've pressed the attorney general and uh, folks in leadership at the Justice Department to pursue that. And then finally, let's turn the tables on the anti-choice lawmakers who put the Hyde Amendment into law and prevented federal funding from being used to, for abortions. Let's turn the tables on them and say no longer can federal funds go to states that are restricting abortions. Thank you. Um, now, same question to you, Jamie. Um, do you support a federal law that guarantees uh, women their reproductive rights regardless of where they live? I absolutely do, and I am clearly highly aware of of the importance of that law. I have exactly the same policy points that Josh would make. Um, I, too, would sponsor the Women's Health Protection Act on day one in office and quite literally go down the entire list we went down together. I think we also need to look at why the Dobbs decision has had such an immediate impact in how we think about protecting women's health going forward. This is that a huge part of this district, a huge part of New York State, and much of this country is the OBGYN desert. So people aren't getting the care they need at before a six week ban, before an eight week ban, before sometimes a 24 week ban because they can't get to it. So we need to understand what the true barriers are to women and they're not just policy barriers. They're the presence of healthcare providers in our local communities that women can get to in a timely manner when they suspect that they are pregnant so they can make good decisions in real time. So I would tackle this from a policy perspective but also with consideration for the lives of women on the ground in small cities, big cities, small towns, rural areas, urban areas across the US look like. We need to come at this from both angles so that we both codify the right and truly protect access to healthcare for women going forward. All right, Um, our next question, uh, Jamie, which you'll be answering first, um, relates to Columbia County. In the new 19th district, Columbia County was separated from other Hudson Valley counties on the east side of the Hudson. Can you describe what you consider to be the top issues facing our county and how you would address them if you were elected? Absolutely, and I'll start by saying that I think every county in the new 19th feels a little bit like an orphan in some way. And 
a big job of Josh or mine or whoever represents this district will be to help create the identity of the new 19th. And I believe that we can do that. That said, the top issue we must address in Columbia County is housing. And this is an incredibly complex issue. I wish that we had a single solution. If I knew the single solution, I would probably go and build it right now instead of running for Congress, because I think it underlies so many other issues in this community. I think of it as a complex toolbox and we need to deploy all of the tools at once. So, because we do not have time to see which one is going to work. From a policy perspective, that means revisiting the Community Reinvestment Act. This is a piece of legislation that I worked under early in my career, working on private public partnerships to finance affordable housing projects. It was a great piece of legislation that revolutionized much of the urban housing stock in this country. It was not designed to impact rural areas and small towns. And frankly, it's been layered with such heavy regulation that it's no longer a feasible way to finance housing. So we need to go back and either revisit that piece of policy entirely or create a separate piece of legislation that is designed to specifically address housing issues in rural areas and small towns. I also think that a lot of housing comes from coordination between local, state, and federal government. This is, you know, at, at a local level, it's zoning. There's a lot of great available at a state level. You're going to need a leader who knows these communities well, knows the different layers of government, and understands how to bring everyone to the table to make sure that we're working on all fronts at once. And I know that I can make those conversations happen. Josh, same question to you. What do you think the top issues are for Columbia County, and how would you address them? Yeah, thank you. Well, so the first thing is um, <laughs> to show up and ask the question of all of you, what are the top issues uh, that you're facing? And so over the course of the last, what has it been, seven weeks, uh, since these new lines have come out, I've been to Columbia County uh, for at least half a dozen uh, more than that events. We have more coming up uh, next week. Uh, I sat down with uh, the mayor of Hudson a couple of weeks ago and asked him exactly this question. And what he told me was consistent with what I've been hearing across the rest of the county. Two issues, uh, mental health uh, services are desperately needed uh, and are in too short a supply. It's creating a huge burden on our criminal justice system. I'll talk about that in one second and the housing issue. Um, and since Jamie raised that, I'll talk about that as well. Uh, there was a provision that was included in the bipartisan infrastructure law that would have, I think, solved a lot of the housing uh, shortages and affordable housing shortages we're seeing uh, both in Columbia County and across other parts of the district. Unfortunately, when that bill was going through final negotiations, the housing provision was taken out. I think that should be reintroduced and pushed for as a standalone bill. It would do a couple of things. Uh, most importantly, it would fund the construction of new affordable housing. And this is really important. It would require the use of local organized labor for that construction. I've met with our trades unions uh, multiple times over the last couple of days. And that is great work, great jobs that we should be doing right here in uh, this district. On the mental health issue, what we're seeing in Columbia County and we're seeing across the district is a situation where our mental health uh, system has been so badly underfunded for so long that so many people have untreated uh, concerns and their first interaction with anybody is through law enforcement. That's terrible for folks who are in crisis. People who are in crisis deserve help, not a prison cell and handcuffs. And so one of the things that I know is happening is um, really exciting investments to make sure intervention and diversion programs are available in the criminal justice system. Something I worked on as counsel in the Senate and would be really eager to continue working on. Um, our next question deals with the topic of climate. And this question will go to Josh first. Um, so we got four questions and I think I've found a way to combine them. Uh, what do you think are the best ways for the US to meet its climate goals what role, if any, does offshore drilling and carbon capture utilization um, have to do with us um, reaching our climate goals? Yeah, this, this, is, um, this is another issue here. Every single county uh, that I visit, this is a, one of the top three questions uh, we always get. And as a dad to a two-year-old, I think often about, are we going to leave him a planet that's uh, habitable? Uh, so I think about this in a couple of, there, there's, a, there's a lot to this, but let me just share sort of two top priorities. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm so proud to have grown up in upstate New York in a working class community where we had a really strong manufacturing history because what we always did was made the products and the technologies and the things that the world needed to solve some of our biggest problems, whether it was fighting World War II, bringing in the, the New Deal, 
uh, bringing in the technology revolution. Right now, the world is facing this huge existential challenge of climate change. And I'm so excited about the possibilities here in upstate New York to rise to that challenge by, by creating new, innovative, cutting edge jobs to deal with it. Just this morning, I was talking with some folks about some uh, a solar panel uh, factory that we're trying to get up and running here. Our SUNY system has amazing technologies around clean energy storage so that we can start building the technologies to save solar power when the sun isn't shining and wind power when the wind's not blowing. So we look at climate change as a huge challenge, but I'm encouraging all of us to look at it as a huge opportunity for us to do great things across upstate New York for working families. Uh, number two, the decision that we just saw come out of the Supreme Court in West Virginia versus EPA, um, I haven't gotten all the way through it. I'm pretty close. The one conclusion I've definitely drawn from it so far is that there is a, a urgent, immediate need in Congress to revise uh, some of our uh, environmental protection statutes to make sure it's crystal clear that we're giving EPA and our regulators the authority they need to fight climate change, because right now uh, their hands are completely tied. So Jamie, same question to you. What are the best ways we can meet our climate goals? Um, what role, if any, should carbon capture utilization play in that um, offshore drilling, et cetera? So I see carbon capture as a huge opportunity and I see this as a huge opportunity for New York 19. One detail I think a lot of people don't realize about this district when they first look at a map is the huge presence that we have of SUNY campuses, um, and other institutions of higher learning, and the fact that they're not just concentrated in a few areas, but very much distributed throughout our smaller towns. Cornell has been doing some cutting edge research on green tech. I would love to see us funding a rollout of that to SUNY campuses, not one SUNY campus, but SUNY campuses directly in each of our towns, so that without significant transportation costs, we have the opportunity to build a workforce in this district that is a national leader in green tech job training and the jobs that we know we're going to need for tomorrow. I'm particularly inspired by the Green Jobs Act that Antonio Delgado sponsored, which looked at how a green economy would look in 2050 and then used that to map into two pieces, both what job training would need to be done. And that's what I would like to see specifically at every SUNY campus, no matter how big or small in each town. And then also frankly, looking at what jobs therefore would be sidelined. We have to bring our unions in this to the table on this to move this forward. And it's by accurately looking at what skills are going to most likely be impacted and bringing the unions to the table that we're going to be able to get meaningful climate legislation around a green economy moving forward. And I see such an opportunity for New York 19 to be a leader in this. The other thing that I would highlight, and I'd like to see us be a leader in national conversation is it is a shared sentiment across this district that people love this place, what it has allowed their family to do, to exist in, to grow, whether that's the Catskills, the fields. Um, and I think that by just, just adopting a shared language, we could be a national leader in how to talk about climate in a purple district, using words like good dirt and good soil instead of climate, which unfortunately is politicized and seems to push people away from the table. I see some huge opportunities here. Um, our next question um, is, uh, what are your positions on national paid maternity leave, access to affordable childcare, and other difficult challenges facing working women in the United States today? Uh, and the question goes to Jamie. Absolutely. So my position is this is something we need to do not just for families, but for our economy. We know that 30% of women left the workforce during COVID. It set us back a full generation in terms of women's participation in the workforce. The Bloomberg organization has done research that estimates that when women are engaged in the economy, fully engaged, the global economy would grow by $2 trillion. Unfortunately, childcare falls to women and we need to support it. This does not just mean putting big childcare locations on corporate campuses. That supports one type of worker. We need to think about how childcare really looks. There's some incredible things going on in the Hudson Valley to tackle childcare. I'd particularly point to the day one programs, which are creating early education training programs that can be completed in six to eight weeks. I'd look to roll that out across the district. The other thing I talked to a startup who was actually looking for a manufacturing location, and we were talking about an opportunity in the district, had this conversation last week. They're creating modular childcare child structures. So 
trailers that are quite literally pre-outfitted to provide childcare for 10 or 12 children. When we look at our smaller employers, which is what tends to dominate the New York 19 economy, that's what's gonna be more realistic than putting in a, a big corporate location on site. It's also something that empl employers or a town can afford and have a low lead time on. I see us being a childcare leader at bringing childcare into smaller communities by leveraging interesting, different, not policy oriented so much as reaching out to startups that are doing this differently, inviting them to New York 19 as a place where we'll incubate and lead the nation in affordable childcare in each of our communities. Josh, same question to you. What are your positions on paid maternity leave, affordable childcare and challenges facing working women? Yeah, well, 100% support the policies. And I, I, I think I, I, I view this maybe a little bit differently because I do think the lack of paid family leave in this country is a, is a major policy failure uh, in this country. Um, and I have a track record of working on these issues. So um, I start from just the fundamental principle that no parent should ever have to choose between their wages and their livelihood on the one hand or caring for uh, a newborn child or uh, a sick parent or sibling on the other hand. There, there's no excuse, none, for the fact that we are one of the richest countries in the history of the world. And we have uh, folks who are um, the 1% in this country with, with tons and tons of wealth. And then you've got wage earners and low wage workers who have to go back to work a week after their child is born and don't have that opportunity to, to bond with them. It's just, it's, it's, it's terrible economics. It's morally unacceptable. And we're way past due and doing something about it. So what have I, I, I have a record on these issues. I, I, I love to tell you what I'll do, but I think it's more important to tell you what I've done. When I was working as a labor and pension fellow for Senator Ted Kennedy, that Family Medical Leave Act was a relatively new statute big corporations were coming in trying to rip it apart and weaken it. And I was part of the efforts uh, to defend that landmark statute. That statute clearly doesn't go far enough. And we need to have paid family leave to make sure that workers full uh, wages are being reimbursed and giving them enough time uh, to be home. The other thing I've done as a lawyer in private legal practice, I've represented uh, mothers who were retaliated against because they exercised their family medical leave rights to take care of a sick child. And so this is a top priority of mine and um, something that I'll be a, a very strong advocate for. Last thing I'll say very quickly, I think it's, I, I've, I'm very vocal about the fact that I took a long period of leave to be with my son when he was born. I think more men need to take leave and, and say that so that it is uh, not stigmatized in the way that it sometimes is. All right, our next question, um pertains to sort of uh, our agricultural character. Uh, it's two parts. Um, how do we preserve our rural character in the face of continuing development? And second, what will you do on the federal level to help fund and build the kind of business infrastructure needed to support our farms, most of which are small businesses, everything from affordable financing to funding regional distribution networks and broadband access? We'd love to hear your thoughts on these concerns. Is this one? I lost track here. <laughs> Is this to me? All right, that's you. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. So, um, so one of the things I will do is ask to be on the ag committee. Um, I think we need our community needs a seat at the table uh, on the ag committee, and I think next Congress, the next session of Congress, is a huge, huge opportunity for this region because the farm bill is coming through. Uh, the farm bill is the major piece of federal legislation that's reauthorized every five, six, seven years, and it's up for reauthorization next year. It is the vehicle that's moving through Congress that will allow us to effectuate all kinds of uh, changes. There's a handful of top priorities I have uh, based on the conversations I've been having across this district. Um, number one, and this it goes into the climate change issue as well, um, a lot of our farmers who want to uh, buy uh, cover crops are not being reimbursed at the rates they need to be. There's an amendment to put on the farm bill to make sure cover crop reimbursement is increased. So many farmers that I'm talking to across this district are having trouble getting access to the labor and the workers they need. Uh, when I worked in the Senate, we worked on a comprehensive immigration reform bill that would have reformed our visa system so that uh, the farm worker visas that are available would create more opportunities 
uh, for more uh, workers for our farms in upstate New York. Um, there's a huge challenge right now with access to markets. This is, this is particularly a concern in the dairy industry. We've seen massive corporate consolidation uh, around dairy co-ops, and that's squeezing our farmers who have less places to bring their products, and it's hurting consumers who don't have as many choices and as much competition. So the Justice Department, the Federal Trade Commission, uh, the Commodities Futures uh, Commission need to do more to break up uh, a lot of the, the, the corporate consolidation in uh, our agricultural industry. And finally, uh, we need to increase the minimum wage so that our farmers are playing on a level playing field. Right now, we're paying wages that are higher than in other states, and that puts our farmers at a disadvantage, and they deserve to be on a level playing field. Jamie, same question to you. How do we preserve our rural character? Um, while also, um, please describe what you would do on the federal level to help fund uh, agricultural businesses and support that rural character. Absolutely. So I think that one thing that we need to be hyperly focused on is the nature of our open spaces come from the very, very active conservation efforts that have um, dominated, frankly, much of different areas of New York 19 over the past few decades. We need to make sure that those conservation groups are incentivized to conserve things as farmland, not just as open space, because many farmers who either want to enter the business, which believe it or not, people still do, or who wanna stay in family farming and want to buy land simply can't afford it because it's been conserved as purely open land, which is bought for view shed purposes. The land that is accessible to farmers, and I'm happy to speak to my own family story and how we were able to buy our land is land that is conserved as farmland and therefore is at a discount for someone who will actively farm it. So that's number one. If we're serious about preserving open space in New York 19, the amazing rural character, we need to work with our conservation groups to incentivize ag land over simply open land. Um, the second piece I would layer on and the farm bill will be an opportunity for this. And I also would join the Ag Committee. The Ag Committee is dominated by representatives of large industrial farms. Farming here in New York State is primarily medium and more so even than that, small scale family farms. Much of the farm bill, farm bill incentivizes agricultural um, industry participants behavior through tax credits. The reality is that our farmers simply do not have access to capital throughout the year. This is everything from the cover crops that Josh mentioned. The farmers that I know can't even afford to buy them, much less ask to be reimbursed. We need to move to grant-based funding if we want to be able to support the type of smaller farms that dominate the New York 19 market. Um, I think the opportunity in the farm bill is specifically to create financial institutions that ha will provide grant access and easier capital access to our local farmers because that's the biggest barrier across the board. Farmers have no access to capital to grow their business or to participate in any of the programs that we're putting in place to incentivize them to run their businesses in certain ways. Our next question has to deal with a very hot topic right now. And this question will go to Jamie first. Uh, what specific gun control measures do you support how would you work to enact them and what legislation do you realistically think is possible? Should Congress enact a bill banning assault weapons? Absolutely, so I'm very open that I'm a gun owner. Um, you know, running a farm, it, it's a tool. Uh, we have a gun that we break down into the pieces go in two safes and the bullets go in a third one. It holds bull two bullets at a time, we choose to use one. Um, I will work on guns by bringing gun owners back to the table. I can tell you that gun owners across the board, even those who use it in the way that we do as a tool or gun owners who use it as a weapon, I'm sorry, a weapon, excuse me, um, or gun owners who use it for hunting feel completely vilified. And it's why people feel pushed away rather than coming together. I can speak to those in my community who are gun owners who all agree that there is no place for an assault weapon in civilian hands. I think I have told many of you the story of my eight-year-old turning to me on the way to school the day after Texas and asking if he should try to climb out the window or hide in the bathroom. Um, I think others of you were with me when my 10-year-old chose to stand up after all the grown-ups talked at our um, gun violence vigil in Chatham and he told us what it was really like to be in school for an active shooter drill. I would be a new voice in Congress. I would put a piece of legislation on the floor that in the same breath bans assault weapons in civilian hands while protecting hunting rifles and those used on farms. I think it is the only way that we will bring gun owners to the table. We have no credibility among gun owners that the next bill after an assault weapon ban is not going to take everyone's gun away immediately. 
if we want to get assault weapons out of people's hands so that our children can go to school safely, we need to bring gun owners to the table and we need to protect hunting rifles. It is the only way we will get them to the table. And it is the only way that we will feel safe with our kids at school or us in the supermarket it is the only way that we will open a dialogue that includes everyone in this country. I think I'm very uniquely positioned to do that. Josh, same question to you. What gun control measures do you support? How would you enact them? Um, and would you support a ban on assault weapons? Yeah, so um, I have a record on, on this. I was counsel uh, in the United States Senate after Sandy Hook. And so one of the uh, most difficult and also one of the most frustrating things I've worked on was the uh, package of gun violence prevention measures that we got through the Senate, we got it to the, to, to the floor, which was no easy task, uh, and it failed there. And what I saw was an incredibly broken and corrupt system where what we had proposed had 90% support among the public and over 85% support among gun owners, but it was still defeated uh, on the Senate floor. The reason? Our campaign finance system is totally broke and the NRA is flooding uh, Congress and was able to overcome the will and the voices of the people. So here's here's my plan for uh, what I would support and what I would push for uh, on the gun violence prevention front, uh, informed by my experience working as counsel in the Senate after Sandy Hook. Number one, I'll co-sponsor H.R. 1808. I think it's the best version of an assault weapons uh, bill uh, that's out there. Uh, I think it's constitutional. I think it's going to uh, get uh, weapons of war off the streets. Uh, I support it. Uh, number two, our background check system is is terribly broken, um, and this it's broken for two reasons. Number one, we're not conducting background checks on all the things we need to conduct background checks on. And number two, in the places where we are conducting background checks, the records aren't in the system because our states and localities are so overwhelmed. So NICS, the National Incident Criminal Background Check System that's run by the FBI, is in massive, massive need of reform. Number third, we need to repeal. Uh, number three, we need to repeal the Dickey Amendment. This is a, an amendment that prevents the CDC from dealing with gun violence as a public health issue, which it clearly is at this point in our country. To say it's an epidemic is uh, an understatement. Um, so those are among uh, the, the various things I've worked on uh, as counsel in Congress and would work on again. Josh, our next uh, um, topic covers student loans and you will uh, take the first stab at it. 43 million Americans have student loan debt. Do you support student debt cancellation? What policy prescriptions will you advocate for to make higher education or more higher education more affordable? Yeah, so uh, I I uh, know this issue very well and very personally because when I uh, I took out a lot of I had savings for my newspaper route, I took out a ton of student loans, uh, well over six figures uh, that I it took me a long time to pay off, and so this is this is very. <laughs> Uh, very personal. I would not have been able to go to college and I would have not have been able to go to law school without the benefit of federal student loan programs. It just, we could not afford it, my family. Um, but because of those programs, I was able to get the education that I got and that allowed me to have opportunities in my career. So I come at this from a very, very personal uh, level. This is, there are two things I, I, I think about on this issue. Number one, yes, we need student debt relief. I want us to be thoughtful and pragmatic and deliberate in the way we're delivering it. Folks like my sister, uh, who has been struggling under the weight of student loan debts, well, uh, as a public school teacher, deserves to student loan relief and to have her debts uh, cleared. Uh, folks like one of my best friends from high school, who's a firefighter in Binghamton, he is providing a public service. His debts should be relieved. Where I want to be really careful about this are situations where folks are in very high wage industries like uh, Wall Street uh, bankers or hedge fund managers or uh, corporate executives who can afford to pay off their student loans. I think uh, I, do, I don't want to subsidize people who are very wealthy and can afford to pay it. I want to provide relief to the people who most need it. And so we need to be targeted and deliberate on that front. The other point on this, though, that I think is is, is, a, is a, almost a more fundamental point is that we've got to reimagine what it means to get into the middle class in this country and what kind of education is required for that. I grew up in a family where you could leave high school and go get a middle class job working with your hands. We have to reinvest in uh, career and technical and vocational education in this country so that a college degree is not the only way uh, to move up in our economy.
Jamie, same question to you. Do you support student debt cancellation? And what policy prescriptions will you advocate for to make higher education more affordable? Student debt is, is a huge issue and it, it has crippled members of multiple generations and it has the potential to cripple our economy in ways. I think that we need to look at this as I talked in my opening speech about coming at things with creative solutions. We also have another challenge in our economy, which is that it's there are areas that are having trouble staffing basic services. There are areas that are having significant problems recruiting workers. Um, there are areas with significantly slowed growth, frankly, like many of the rural areas in New York 19. So while I think that student loan forgiveness needs to be a tool on the table, I would like us to use it to deploy resources across our economy. So there's the idea of forgiving student loans if someone is a teacher, but can we forgive even more if they come into an area? I was um, in Binghamton yesterday and someone was describing to me a school district just outside the city where when a teacher leaves, they're not rehired because there are no applicants. That needs to be a place where we use increased student loan forgiveness to move teachers in, doctors in rural areas, childcare providers in rural areas. I, again, would like to see New York 19 be a national leader in using student debt as a tool to shift elements of our workforce. There was an element of, of one version of Build Back Better, which I was highly supportive of, that looked at community service and doing specific work years as a way to relieve student debt. And I see what I just described as an exact extension of that. And I would bring, bring that provision of Build Back Better back to the House floor. All right, our next question goes to you first, Jamie, and it has to do with our opponent this November. Um, winning the middle will be very important in this election. Mark Molinaro is very good at that. I don't know if I agree with that. Um, how do you plan to do that? And what do you plan to do to appeal to independent voters in the district? Can you discuss what you believe to be Molinaro's biggest flaw? We will win this district and we will make sure that the one of the 435 votes in the house that everyone on this call is represented by is one that is pro-choice, pro-people, pro-gun reform. And we will only be able to do it in this district with a slight Republican margin by building a coalition. I see two avenues to build a coalition. It's gonna be a coalition based on lived experience. It's lived experience that will make people cross the party line that they may be uncomfortable with and maybe haven't thought about crossing previously in their lives. The two avenues that I see are moms. I've spoken directly to moms who feel abandoned by both parties, Republican women on row and Democratic women who feel that the weight of the world was dropped on them as moms over the past two years, teaching their kids from home, well being asked to be active members of um, the economy, and while knowing, frankly, a year or six months in, that what we were doing wasn't great for our youngest children. I've heard so many stories of five-year-olds with speech delays, many in our smaller towns where there is no speech therapist because that five-year-old has been only in environments where someone's face has been covered like this um, and they haven't been able to develop speech naturally. Moms had that instinct a year ago, 18 months ago, that this was a huge problem. We watched our children falling behind. We can build a coalition on those two pieces of lived experience around moms. The other place that we can build a coalition is only a gun in this country who want meaningful gun reform, but are only going to trust it coming from a gun owner who's going to protect hunting rifles in the same breath that we ban assault weapons, because that's the piece of legislation that we're going to be able to get through and allow our children to go to school safely and us to exist, go to parades, go to the supermarket safely. Josh, question to you. Um, how are you going to appeal to independents and those in the middle and discuss Molinero's biggest flaw? Yeah, well, the first thing I've done, and I think this is a huge accomplishment, I don't want to overstate it, but I got my dad to change his registration uh, from Republican to Democrat. So we have one uh, crossover. So that's great. I think I'm, I, I saw my aunt and uncle last night. They're, they're persuadable as well. So we're building momentum, at least in the Riley family. Um, I get this question all the time. How are you going to beat Mark Molinaro? He is such a great politician. He is, he is, a, he is, he is so good at being a politician, how are you ever gonna beat this great politician? And what I have to remind people is what you're perceiving as his greatest strength in this district is actually his greatest weakness. 
folks around here are pretty sick and tired of professional politicians and really want more public servants. People like Antonio Delgado, who came at this uh, without having been in politics before. And so this is going to be an election not about Democrat, Republican, red, blue. This is going to be an election about change or status quo. And if you like the status quo, if you like the way things have been going for the last 30 years, when we lost two thirds of our manufacturing jobs and families are struggling to get by, vote for the status quo professional politician. If you want new leadership, new vision and change, that's uh, what I'm offering in this race. I think there's some really important contrasts that I'm excited about drawing with Mark Molinaro. I was born in this district. He wasn't. I was raised in this district. He wasn't. I live in this district. He doesn't. I've never taken corporate PAC money. He does. I've worked in the private sector and the public sector. He hasn't. Uh, so we'll have that debate and I'm eager to have it. Um, in terms of bipartisanship, I have a track record on this. I worked in uh, the Senate at a very, very divided time. I mentioned earlier how dysfunctional it was to the point where Ted Cruz shut down the government over Planned Parenthood funding. And even in that environment, I was able to bring very progressive Democrats and very conservative Republicans together to get legislation done. And you can only do that if you're pragmatic and if you're willing to get deals done. And I have a record of, uh, of doing that. All right, Josh, our next question um, goes to you. Um, and I'm going to broaden it just a little bit. So first, are you accepting any corporate PAC money? And second, um, what should we do about our broken campaign finance system? Yeah, this is, the, this is the most important question because our broken campaign finance system is the root of all evil in our politics. Um, and it sounds abstract. Uh, it's not. So when you talk about a broken campaign finance system, you know, that doesn't necessarily... Uh, resonate with a lot of people, but let's explain to folks what that means in your day-to-day -day life. Congress just failed a couple of weeks ago to pass legislation that would have lowered the cost of your prescription drugs, desperately needed at a time where so many families are struggling to get by. And the reason they did that, the reason Congress failed to do that is because the pharmaceutical industry is lining the pockets of politicians, sending them down to Washington, and having them keep the cost of prescription drugs high. That, that is so wrong. I told you the story about when I worked after Sandy Hook on gun violence issues and we had 90% support and couldn't get anything done because the NRA was flooding politicians with money and drowning out the voices of, of everybody else. So this is the root of all evil. When I was counsel uh, on the Senate, one of the, th one of the things I've been most excited to do in my career, and I consider this my, my moonshot, is getting Citizens United overturned through a constitutional amendment. I worked on, on that constitutional amendment, got it through the Senate Judiciary's constitutional subcommittee the, the, and then the Senate Judiciary Committee. And that's something we've got to fight on every day. I'm not taking any corporate PAC money. I never have taken a penny of corporate PAC money. This is a matter of principle. Uh, for me, we need to lead by example on this. And so uh, from day one, uh, I'll tell you, one of the pieces of advice I got from people who have run for office and done this before is take the corporate PAC money, uh, take every penny you can get your hands on because it's easier to raise money. And as a matter of principle, even though it's harder to raise money, I said I wasn't going to do that. And what we've done instead is raised over $1.2 million in just eight months, even during a crazy redistricting year where most of our contributions are $25 or less. And that's, uh, we need more of that in our democracy. Amy, same question to you. Do you uh, accept corporate PAC money and how would you break our broken campaign? How would you fix our broken campaign finance system? Absolutely. I have not accepted corporate PAC money in this race. I am gonna be very open because I think that this is the approaching things a little bit more creatively. I did accept corporate PAC money, $1,500 of it in my state Senate race. And I did that to take away my opponent's primary source of funding so that we could defeat an anti-abortion candidate. And I felt that taking $1,500 to cut off someone who had funded her with millions of dollars was a way to make sure that we got this anti-abortion representative out of office. I think that in this moment, when the most important thing is to make sure that we put a pro-life, pro-gun reform vote in this district, we're not gonna do it with a hand tied behind our back. So if there's corporate PAC money from a company that is represented in New York 19 and that my team has done their due diligence on and is not a bad actor or a bad corporate citizen and we can get comfortable with, it's gonna help us defeat Mark, Mark Molinaro, codify Roe and push through meaningful gun reform, I will accept that help. Because until we do that, this is how we got in the situation where we're fighting with a hand tied behind our back. That said, in Congress, I absolutely will fight 
for, for um, campaign finance reform because th the situation is that people like Mark, Mark doesn't raise his own money. Mark is being funded by millions from the NRA. This is how we've gotten a situation where we so desperately need someone who's fight for meaningful gun reform that we're actually gonna take the time to look at every single one of our donations and consider corporate PAC money from someone who's fighting for what we are because it's maybe what we need to win this seat. So I will not commit to not taking it because I will commit to winning this seat. That said, and I would ask people to look at every contribution that goes to every candidate, we should all take responsibility for every single one of our donors, individual or corporate, and take a look at who they are and what they represent. All right, Jamie, our next question comes from you. And I haven't been doing this, but I'm gonna give a shout out to the author of the question, our Mayor Kamal Johnson from Hudson. Uh, Mayor Johnson asks, Columbia Memorial Hospital is our county's largest healthcare provider. The staff are working in unsafe conditions, lack of fair wages and staffing shortages. Um, how would uh, the candidates help support our healthcare providers and specifically C Columbia Memorial Hospital? Absolutely, and I've, I've heard so many stories specifically around the impact um, of the staff overload at Columbia Memorial. I think um, just today I, I heard that um, the hospital has had to divert ER trips to other hospitals 45 minutes or an hour away, which obviously has an impact on outcomes and that that's, we cannot be in that situation. I think we need to look at a couple things. I think we need to look at how much we're supporting our unions um, the burden that we've asked our healthcare workers to take on over the past few years. But the reality is that even if we're supporting our workers, many of them have left the healthcare industry. So what are we doing to incentivize training programs at the huge number of SUNY campuses, specifically in New York 19? How are we incentivizing people to stay in this area when they're trained in this area and not taking travel nursing jobs. I think there's some interesting work we can do there around student loan um, leverage programs where we're incentivizing people to stay in the area where they grow up and where they grow up and they're trained. And then we're gonna have to tackle housing. The reason that many people are leaving Columbia Memorial specifically aside from burnout is, and aside from travel nursing jobs is that they, can, they can't afford to live here and they can find a job closer to where they live. So I see this as a multi-pronged issue. We need to train, we need to create incentive programs, help people stay in these areas, and we need to address housing near this critical facility that is the anchor of healthcare in Columbia County. Josh, uh, now the question goes to you. Um, what would you do for Columbia Memorial Hospital and all the problems that we're facing uh, at that facility? Yeah, this is, this is a great uh, question. I, I had a chance to uh, talk with the mayor about this uh, a couple of weeks ago and appreciate how uh, pressing this is. I think there's uh, at least three things that we can do. Uh, I don't want to say do right away, but at least get into motion right away uh, around this. Uh, one is one of the problems we're seeing is that the reimbursement rates that the federal government is paying for services often don't cover costs. Um, this is particularly true with low-income families and, and Medicaid. Uh, when I graduated from law school, the civil rights case I took on was actually uh, a big component of it was trying to increase the reimbursement rates in the Medicaid system to incentivize more providers to provide care in areas that uh, were lacking that care. So I think that's one of the things we need to look at is making sure uh, reimbursement rates are covering costs so that you have uh, enough uh, providers um, I think there's some amendments that can be made to the National Health Service Corps. It's a program that's designed for exactly this type of problem, but hasn't been performing probably as well as it should. Uh, that, that would involve increasing uh, funding and incentives for people to go into um, service in uh, communities that really need it, whether it's rural areas, sometimes it's, it's underserved uh, urban areas. Um, there's components around this. We talked earlier about student loan forgiveness. I talked about my sister and my friend who's a firefighter. This is another area where if, if we have workforce shortages and people are overworked and underpaid, let's bring in some reinforcements and do it that way. The other component to this that I think is worth considering is uh, the need for more uh, telemedicine. Um, we can only do that if we are simultaneously improving broadband access. There's a lot of opportunities um, to do that right now. Um, I was just, I, I had a, a really great conversation earlier today where 
Um, I learned about some things we can do in the, the USDA programs to improve broadband access. If we do that, we can also improve access to telemedicine. And if we do that, we're putting less strain on the physical uh, infrastructure and workforce in our health system. Um, all right, so our next question, Josh, goes to you first. Um, do you currently reside in the district full-time? I do. Uh, Jamie, same question to you. My family's farm is 1,000 feet from the edge of the district, right on the Columbia Duchess border. If elected, I will have a residence in Ancrum. Okay, um, our next question uh, has to do with solar farms. Um, what do you feel is more important, uh, large industrial solar fields or to preserve farmland tourism and our view sheds? And the question goes to Jamie first. So I'm, I'm very aware of the structure in New York State that has facilitated these huge, huge solar farms. There's one in Ulster County I drive by constantly as we sort of we head west into the district and every single time I drive by it I think of Shepherd's Run and I think of what the initial proposal looked like. I recognize the need for renewables on all levels. I think that we should be incredibly proud to be in Columbia County and to be part of the community that came together the way that people did around Shepherd's Run. The second iteration of the Shepherd's Run proposal, which really spread out the solar panels and actually brought agriculture, um, agrivoltaics specifically for those who are familiar with them, which raised up the solar panels enough that the farmland below could be active and created an ecotourism destination. This concept where children and families would even come and ride their bikes in this large, very dispersed solar installation versus the installation in Warsing, which is literally a dense, I think 400 acres of solar panels. That said, I truly wish that we were not in this situation where there was no legal recourse for a community who doesn't simply want 400 straight acres of solar panels. I'm incredibly proud of the way that Copake worked to work with a developer who frankly didn't need to be flexible. And I still hope that this is a place where Columbia can be a leader in renewable tourism, if you will, creating a destination around renewable energy that works within a community rather than against it. Josh, same question to you. Uh, what are your feelings on large industrial solar fields um, and contrast that with the need to preserve farmland tourism and our view sheds? Yeah, we need to the the latter. <laughs> this isn't really a close call. Uh, we need to do everything we can to preserve uh, our farmland and preserve uh, our environment and uh, the culture that we have here. And here's the problem: our farmers are struggling so much to get by right now that they're put to this impossible choice of giving up <laughs> land and giving up business to these industrial interests. Uh, to, to build these things when they should be able to have a good living doing the work that their families have been doing here in upstate New York for generations and generations. So all of this, I think, in a lot of ways goes back to the conversation we had earlier about the various things we need to do uh, to throw our farmers uh, a lifeline. Um, one of the other major problems we're having with respect to uh, these massive uh, industrial um, solar farms is that a lot of them actually have are, are controlled by foreign interests. So the problem is the problem is even worse than it sounds on the surface. You've got foreign interests coming in and buying up land that has been in upstate New York for generations for hardworking families. I mean, that is that is a terrible injustice. And so um, we've got to start fighting back and, and, and making sure our farmers have uh, have the livelihood that they've they've had for for a long time. One other issue while we're talking about solar panels and the solar industry that I think is one really important and also really timely based on what we just saw today out of the USTR is um, the, the tariff situation that we currently have with China is uh, deeply, deeply concerning. Um, right now, the Biden administration is considering lifting a whole bunch of tariffs uh, that had been placed on the solar industry in China so that we could build a solar manufacturing industry, not just here in the United States, but here in upstate New York. There are amazingly exciting opportunities to be on the forefront of solar 
uh, manufacturing here in upstate New York. And if the Biden administration does the wrong thing with those tariffs, it'll be a massively squandered opportunity. Um, I believe the next question goes to Josh. Um, Josh, our Northern Columbia County towns were promised grant money uh, to improve broadband access. How would you help us um, assure that we get that funding um, from the agri agricultural department? Yeah, um, probably, honestly, the first thing I'll do, I don't know if Dave Berman's on this call. <laughs> He's become one of my go-to. I'd probably call him, find out. I need to know, look, I need to know more about what exactly the problem is. Uh, when was the grant applied for? Uh, why was it rejected? What's the holdup? Who do we need to talk to? Um, I'd probably have, I'd, I would treat this the same way I would treat a client coming to my office and saying, hey, I have a problem. The first thing I would do is ask a million questions to try to fully understand the problem. But let me just tell you based on what you just told me, sort of what my uh, instincts are. Um, to the extent it's a bureaucratic red tape issue, um, this falls into the category of constituent services. And this is a top, top, top priority of, of mine. It's, it's one of the things I took away from my time in Congressman Hinchy's office is one of the most valuable things you can do, whether the person in front of you is a Republican or Democrat, voted for you or not, one of the most important things you can do is cut through red tape in the bureaucracy to make sure people are getting the benefits that they're entitled to and the help they need. So we are going to have, I, I, I'm not making promises I can't keep, I am promising you we are gonna have the most dedicated, hardworking constituent services team in the United States here in the 19th district. And there will be folks uh, who will be able to, to navigate this issue. My guess is there's a there's a part of this issue here is gonna require facilitating conversations between some of the grant management analysts at USDA and our folks on the ground. I think having our folks on the ground have those conversations directly will probably be one of the most important ways to, to break through that. To the extent there's other issues um, where uh, you know USDA is not doing the things that they're required to do by law, one of the really important tools in the toolbox for any member of Congress beyond just writing bills and voting on bills is the congressional oversight and congressional subpoena authority. And to the extent we had to put leverage on USDA to try to shake this thing loose, those are some of the tools I would look to do that. Uh, Jamie, same question to you. There's grant money for broadband access. How will you help our counties get it or our towns get it? Absolutely. So I, I think this does come down to constituent service. It also comes down to presence. When we looked at a district of this size, we realized this is not something where you can have a campaign office on one end and say to people, hey, well, give us a call if, if you want to meet with us. You need to be physically present so that you're there at, in a campaign at the beginning of every conversation. So I believe that we're the only campaign right now that has teams on both ends of the district and we're looking at putting a swing team in the middle. And that is how we would structure a constituent services operation. We also looked at who has best in class constituent services in these larger, more rural districts. And there's a number of districts out frankly, in the Midwest, and in some ways, New York 19 is a lot more like the Midwest than it is our downstate area, who have mobile constituent services, which is in a, in a community once a week. And the reason I highlight this is that we need a representative who's there at the beginning of the conversation and knows what's going on, who's highlighting programs to towns, to local leaders, and knows that this, this application went in and isn't just being called when the ball is dropped is part of the local dialogue. Um, and I think that by having a dedicated constituent service presence, the other place I would point to is advocating for more direct to, com direct to community funding to avoid issues like this. So I am, I think you've probably all heard me talk about it, a huge fan of Delgado's direct to community funding in the American Rescue Package. And I'm a huge fan because it's what I hear about from people on the ground in the district. They said something got done because we got money without red tape. And I would advocate for regular direct community funding in every budget so that we're not reliant on chasing grand dollars in instances like this. Um, we are nearing the end of our forum, so we're just gonna do a couple more questions. Um, the next question begins with Jamie. Uh, and the question has to do with job training. Um, what type of training would you consider or, or how would you support trainings for local jobs especially in the trades um, and other vocational careers. Absolutely, and I can't emphasize the importance of working closely with the trades. Historically, the economy of New York 19 has had, 
has had a very strong middle class and a very strong middle class largely driven by the trades. I have very, very strong relationships with the building trades unions. Um, and what we need to do is focus on trainings that are in our high schools. So through BOCES programs or with transportation provided, we can have the best training in the world. And if it's not in a town or with transportation provided, people are not going to get from that, get, get to it. And that's what we're hearing every time from our union partners. They can build the best perfect training center in the world. When they integrate it into a high school, there's some great examples of where it was done effectively in Ulster, they get more enrollment. So we need to focus on working with um, our educational partners to roll that out in every way possible. Um, the second place that I would focus on job training is leveraging these SUNY campuses. Again, we have more SUNY campuses in this district than any other district in New York State. They're geographically closer to people than many realize. Are we only offering traditional college classes or is there a place to leverage that SUNY network to get more direct trade training, which allows more money to people's pockets more quickly once they enter the workforce? And how can we leverage that already existing network of educational facilities? Josh, same question to you. How would you um, support um, jobs that uh, fill different trades, vocational training, things like that? Yeah, uh, just one point of clarification on something. Uh, so we, uh, I think Jamie had mentioned being the only campaign with uh, operations on both sides of the district. We have a field officer who's coming in from the state coordinated, uh, a big state coordinated campaign and is, is, uh, is will be located on the ground uh, in Columbia County within, within days. Um, so this issue is uh, really personal to me um, and it's a big reason why when I left college, I, I went to the US Department of Labor to work in the Employment and Training Administration on workforce development programs. Um, when it became very clear that we were gonna lose about 18,000 jobs in Endicott because IBM was closing down, uh, my dad at the time asked to take the third shift at the factory, which is the midnight shift, uh, the overnight shift, the graveyard shift. And uh, he went into work at night, got home around four or five in the morning, and he'd get a quick shower, grab a cup of coffee, jump in his car and drive a couple hours out to Delhi Community College, uh, where he could take vocational courses to learn landscape architecture, because that's a job that you can't ship overseas. Um, I've never been as proud of anybody uh, in my life. And it taught me that when you face big challenges and you face some adversity, uh, you stand up, you fight back and you do something about it. And that's what he did. Um, we need more of those programs. Uh, you know, it took him four years to get his two-year degree. I actually make fun of him sometimes. I graduated and got my college degree a year before he got his. Uh, he had never gone to college before that. Um, and I'm incredibly proud of that. So um, I get really uh, uh, fired up about this issue. Um, the Workforce Opportunity and Innovation Act is the landmark uh, federal workforce training statute. Uh, it's coming up for reauthorization next year. This and the Farm Bill are the two huge opportunities we have in upstate New York. And if we don't have a seat at the table for reauthorization of those two bills, we're doing something wrong. So in addition to ag, I'm going to ask to be on education and workforce so I can work on, uh, on that reauthorization bill too. I have three or four amendments I want to put on it. I'll tell you all about them another time. So uh, now brings us to our final question. Um, it comes from someone named Liz. And they say, can we please have both of you two distinctly different and wonderful candidates? Mm -hmm. um, instead, <laughs> I'm gonna we'll use- We'll work on it. We'll, yeah. we'll figure out a way to merge, right, Josh? Yeah. yeah. But in, instead, I'm gonna give this opportunity to both of you, starting with um, Josh. Uh, is there any final remarks you'd like to make? Um, can you let people know how they can connect with your campaign, where they can volunteer, how they can support your effort? Yeah, thank you. I just I want to thank you all again so much uh, for doing this, for organizing this, for being here. The questions were were really uh, amazing. Uh, it's a real honor for me to be able to spend the time with you, Jamie. Thank you for uh, stepping up and running for office, and 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 the the campaign you're uh, building, and and the issues you're advocating for. Um, Sam, thanks for your leadership with the committee. I know it's been a crazy uh, year to be a chair. Um, our, I think if, if uh, my campaign manager, Kobe, is on, uh, he can drop our uh, contact information into the chat. Uh, our website is joshreillyforcongress.com. It's R-I-L-E-Y, uh, joshreillyforcongress.com. Uh, and you can contact us there and learn uh, more about the, the campaign. So uh, thank you all so much for doing this. Uh, Jamie, off to you. I'm going to say another round of thank yous for everything from the 
I don't know what the official word is, the Zoom clock situation, which as a candidate is incredibly helpful to the sheer number of people that seem to come to every Columbia County Democratic Committee event. It is truly, the momentum and commitment is, is truly, truly amazing. Um, so th and thank you, all of you, for taking some time on a gorgeous summer evening when I think that there's a feeling of, you know, many people have wanted to take a break from politics. So by being here, it shows that you know what's at stake. And that's so incredibly meaningful. So thank you for taking two hours out of your evening. Um, my campaign website is jamiecheney.com. You can get in touch with us in all kinds of ways there. I know that we have phone banks starting this week. Um, we have been in the field for a while, but I think we have shifts on doors for those of you who are like me and would like to knock on doors all day long. That's my favorite part of campaigning. Um, there's ways to sign up for those as well. And then as always, you can reach out directly to any of the email addresses on there. And we're always happy to sit and have a cup of coffee and learn from your communities about from all of you directly, because that's really the most important part of these conversations. So thank you so much for taking some time out of your evening. Josh, Jamie, I wanna thank you for stepping up. This is not an easy job that you've got in front of you. Um, and so just thank you so much for your willingness to answer our questions. Absolutely. All right. Um, Thanks, Al. The candidates can sign off. Uh, we're going to transition to a special CCDC meeting that's just all about volunteering 